Hello. <laughs> Sorry. Welcome back. We're going to begin with our next panel, Curatorial Practice and the Educational Turn. And from that panel, we will go straight into the final three Curatorial Slam presentations, Mark Mitchell, Renata Stein, and Stacey Steinberger. Um, so if the Curatorial Slam, if they haven't already, please make sure you're up front so you can come up quickly. And I'll hand it over to Krista. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, my name is Krista Clark. I am the Senior Curator of the Arts of Global Africa at the Newark Museum, and I am also the uh, VP of Programs here for the AAMC. And I want to thank Sandra Furman and Griffith Mann for their great work as co-chairs of the conference. I assume that they are still here today. And also thank all of you for toughing it out and sticking it out to the last afternoon sessions. I'm honored to have the opportunity to present uh, to moderate our last panel today, which is on the subject of curatorial practice in the educational turn. Recent museological uh, trends over the past decade or so have seen a move toward greater audience engagement as part of a broader educational turn in curatorial practice. Art museums are now shifting from a model of an institution primarily focused on collecting and interpretive display to one that accommodates social interaction, encourages vi visitor participation in the construction of meaning, and showcases diverse forms of creativity. In some cases, the boundaries between curator and educator have been blurred. An especially apt example of this can be seen with the rise of the curator of public engagement. Some may view this as a radical shift in museum thinking, but I'd like to begin this panel with a look to the past, offering a brief history of public engagement over the course of the past century. It may be surprising for us to see that there are commonalities in progressive educational practices of museums in the early 20th century. At the dawn of the museum age, American museums were in fact distinctive in offering innovations in education and public engagement that was lacking in their European counterparts. Seen then in historical perspective, this moment might be regarded not as the educational turn, but rather as a return to education. The Newark Museum was one of the leaders in museum education in the United States. I gotta get a plug in from my home, home ground. Uh, in 1913, just four years after its founding, museum director John Cotton Dana hired Louise Connolly, supervi supervisor of Newark Public Schools, as education advisor. Almost immediately, she embarked upon a remarkable trip, studying the educational practices and outreach programs of more than 40 museums across the country. In addition to these in-person visits, she read recent literature about museums and condensed her observations and conclusions in a report to the director, published in 1914 as The Educational Value of Museums. This book describes the various types of museums at the time, including, in Connolly's words, museums based on exclusive possession, museums inspiring wonder, museums funded, founded by colleges, museums endowed by individuals, and museums made by the people. And she provides a list of what she called devices in museum teaching used to instruct or attract, which included docentry and lectures, as well as interactive examples that demonstrate processes or techniques, such as a potter's wheel, or how things work. In addition to labels and catalogs as useful interpretive strategies, she also listed display techniques that feature, quote, things grouped about a thought or central uh, or understandable idea, transcending art historical narratives. And she notes, quote, employment of the laity in museum practice, including as an example, a curator in Boston asking a group of children for advice in choosing prints for an exhibition designed for children. She concluded that different methods suited different types of institutions and that the field was ripe for creative innovation. Much of what she found was already in practice or soon adapted at the Newark Museum, including engaging the public through hands-on activities or demonstrations. Pictured here on the right is a weaving demonstration that accompanied the museum's 1916 exhibition, Textile Industries in New Jersey. This exhibition also included a homeland section 
in which Newark, Newark children of immigrant families, and at that time Newark was 75% immigrant population, were asked to contribute through their schools textiles that were made in their home countries. This may be seen as an instance that has a contemporary parallel in visitor participation and knowledge creation for exhibitions today. Outreach and public engagement was considered a priority not just at Newark, but at many museums in the first decades of the 20th century. At the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, Benjamin Gilman introduced the idea of museum docents shortly after the museum first opened its doors in 1909. By 1916, 30 trained docents served 4,300 visitors. Henry Watson Kent at the Metropolitan Museum initiated similar reforms in education that provided a blueprint, blueprint for other museums from the 1920s on. Branch museums were created in the 1920s and 30s, modeled after branch libraries, and were designed to maintain, quote, intimate contact with the public, end quote, according to Philip Youts, director of an experimental branch of the Philadelphia Museum of Art, which was in operation from 1926 to 1933. Yautz, who later took over as director of the Brooklyn Museum, made clear his position on collecting versus interpretation, stating in 1934 that, quote, the public is the starting point, not the collections. The first half of the 20th century also saw the growing professionalization of curatorial practice. Early training programs, such as the Museum Apprentice Program at the Newark Museum, offered preparation in all aspects of museum management including curation and education, which were not formally distinguished. The photo on the top left shows the museum, the very first museum apprentice class in 1926. This program trained in a generation of young women who embarked on successful careers throughout this country. And on the right, on the far right, that's Dorothy Miller, who was in the first class of museum apprentices at the Newark Museum who had uh, many hats at the Newark Museum, inclu including education and exhibition design, um, but probably is best known as the first professionally trained curator at the Museum of Modern Art, who introduced American art, um, contemporary American art, in the 1940s and 50s through a series of important exhibitions. Increasing professionalization of museum staff in interwar years had the effect of separating curatorial responsibilities for acquiring and arranging works of art from public interpretation. Paul Sachs at Harvard introduced a museum training program beginning in the 1930s that, unlike Newark's, centered around collections and connoisseurship and proved an influential model for curatorial practice in museums. Pushing back on the position taken by, Philip, by Brooklyn's Philip Youts, Sachs cautioned against dumbing down content in the hopes of broadening access. By all means, educate, he believed, but without strong collections, the value of education would be limited. By the middle decades of the 20th century, the emphasis on collection development elevated curatorial functions of acquisition and research, interests that also coincidentally aligned with benefactors and patrons of museums. Education took a back seat during these years. Beginning in the 1960s, social movements advocated for greater access and interpretation all over again shifting attention back to the role of education. This coincided with changes in, changes in funding structures, which we all are quite aware of. Rising costs lessened the role of traditional benefactors and prompted museums to turn increasingly to governments, foundations, and eventually corporate, support for, corporate sponsors for support, all of whom, as we all well know, ask for accountability, which is typically measured in terms of visitor numbers and public programs. As we see, this emphasis on public access, outreach, and engagement in recent years, along with the increasingly prominent role of education in general, does not, in fact, represent a new direction. But history never repeats itself exactly. What the past can teach us is to embrace change as inevitable and as a welcome in invitation to innovate. As the pendulum swings back to education, it is up to us to decide how to adapt its means to the 21st century in harmony with the still vital functions of collection development and stewardship. Our panel today brings together curators and educators who offer compelling examples of constructive practices. Among the questions to be addressed by the panelists, how is the curatorial role shifting or evolving in the education turn or return? 
What models for collaboration between education and curatorial departments in engaging audiences? How does interest in visitor experience and participatory projects impact the curatorial profession? How does the position of engagement curator operate in an in-between state between curatorial education and audience? Speaking to these issues today, we have an order of presentation, Nancy Blomberg, Chief Curator and Curator of Native Arts at the Denver Art Museum. And we are sitting to the side, as you can see, so you can see the screen. Um, Allison Agston, uh, Curator of Public Engagement at the Hammer Museum, and Xerxes Mazda, De Deputy Director of Engagement at the Royal Ontario Museum. They each bring to our conversation a rich body of experience and expertise that is detailed in the biographies provided in our conference program. Nancy will talk about the process at the, new, at the Denver Art Museum, where curators are paired with master teachers with specialized, uh, specialized knowledge. Allison is one of the first to hold the position of curator of public engagement. Her program at the Hammer is not necessarily interpretive, but rather intended to forge new connections with visitors through works of art. And Xerxes will present on a new initiative at the ROM that in effect intellectually reframes traditional collection divisions into subject areas or what he calls centers of discovery. We will conclude with a moderated discussion in which I strongly encourage this audience to participate. Thank you. Good afternoon. Um, I'd like to start out by thanking Krista Clark for organizing and moderating this panel and for asking me to be a very small part of it. Uh, I'd also like to say that Heather Nielsen, who is the uh, educator that I work with most closely at the Denver Art Museum, could not be here today, but her voice is a crucial part, an integral part of everything that I will say here today. The Denver Art Museum actually has a very long history of curator-educator collaboration, informally, and more formally to the 1980s when Patterson Williams was hired to be the Dean of Education. In 1990, she was the first educator in residence at the Getty, and during her three months in Los Angeles, she realized, and I quote her, that educators knew lots about producing great programs, but not a lot about objects themselves. Unquote. Her thinking led to pairing educators with specific curatorial departments and their curators to combine the best of both knowledge bases with the objective of producing a much richer visitor experience. 25 years ago, the Denver Art Museum had seven curatorial departments and a large education staff working across all seven departments. Patty reorganized the education department to align specialties with curatorial departments by assigning an educator to a specific curatorial department with the new title of master teacher. They were to work collaboratively on both permanent installations as well as temporary exhibitions. Uh, each master teacher had formal training in education, but also sometimes MAs and even PhDs in their particular subject matters subject areas. I arrived at the Denver Art Museum in 1990, just in time to be part of this new structure of curator, master teacher, and designer. And just as a point of clarification, at the same time that um, I agreed to join this panel early this year, the Department of Education at the Denver Art Museum changed its name to the Department of Learning and Engagement, Structured, restructured the programming staff and changed the titles of master teachers to learning and engagement specialists, albeit with the same job descriptions and roughly collection assignments. So if during my presentation I slip back into the term master teacher, please forgive me because I've been using it for 20 years. This three-person structure has evolved over the years to involve a much larger core team depending on the project. So this afternoon, what I want to do is give you ex four different examples uh, of each of these types of collaboration. Okay. For the first example, I'll discuss the reinstallation of the permanent gallery of the American Indian collection called Artist's Eye, Artist's Hands, Celebrating American Indian Art. 
As one of the first steps in our process, Heather and I conducted many focus groups about what the gallery might contain and what it might not contain. With an encyclopedic collection, we knew that we could support any number of approaches, but we wanted to hear from a wide variety of people before we settled on a specific storyline. Curator and master teacher together developed the questions. We attended each session and then downloaded and analyzed all of the responses. During these sessions, we frequently talked about artists in Native America. And we frequently got very puzzled looks from the participants, followed by the comment that there were no artists in Native America. Uh, that visitors expected to see artists in the painting and sculpture galleries or in the modern and contemporary galleries, but not in the American Indian galleries. That somehow they felt these objects had bubbled up out of immutable cultures, uh, but not from artists. Needless to say, we were shocked. The dam had been collecting and displaying American Indian art for 85 years. In fact, we were one of the first major art museums in this country to do so. So those focus groups were real eye-openers for us, and Heather and I sat down to discuss the implications that this would have on the project that we were about to embark on. Add to this another complication that the assigned gallery, although it was quite large at 23,000 square feet, it was deeply embedded with a second of our two buildings that required traveling from one building to the next, a significant distance in terms of time and effort, and our guest services staff typically advised people to go to the top floor and then work their way down. By the time visitors reached the American Indian Gallery, they were exhausted and often just left. So as a curator, I selfishly wanted to stop this tra uh, traffic pattern and entice visitors to get off the elevator and encounter a monumental work of art that you see here commissioned specifically from a well-known native ceramic artist Roxanne Swensel, who would be actively working in the gallery for nine months to create this clay figure. And with the help of our education staff, encourage visitors to work with her. And by the way, break the stereotype that there were no artists in Native America. Visitors and their families returned again and again over those nine months for the opportunity to work with Rox and actually be a part of this sculpture. Heather and I deliberately embedded interpretive areas within the galleries at very strategic and highly visible locations, instead of the more traditional out-of-the-way corners. This area questions what is American Indian art, with a, a video as well as a seating area and table with provocative questions. Here's another hands-on art-making area called the Bead Studio, with a welcoming atmosphere that encourages participation. We have also provided visitors the opportunity to hear and see an artist at work in their studio, and this is Matteo Romero in his studio uh, captured uh, on film from Santa Fe. Using technology to unravel the complicated story embedded in a contemporary painting, Heather and I developed a list of questions together to discuss with artist Jean Quick de C. Smith and then we brought in a tech expert to create a very interactive, interpretive area. Heather and I agreed that there's no substitute for engaging directly with artists, so we enthusiastically structured together an active and very lively American Indian residence space within the gallery. And here, three or four artists a year work in this space to engage with visitors. And this is uh, printmaker Melanie Yazi, one of our first artists in residence. Another artist was Walt Pourier, a graphic artist who proactively uses art instruction to engage disadvantaged youth who are at risk of dropping out of school, uh, developing alcoholism, or even committing suicide. Visitor studies have indicated that the inclusion of contemporary art has expanded the visitor's definition of American Indian art and further, that our artist-centric approach has humanized the art for our visitors. So the second case study that I want to talk about uh, involves three components. This was a traveling exhibition from the Albright Knox Gallery, a guest curator from a neighboring museum in Denver, the Clifford Still Museum, 
and our master teacher for modern and contemporary art. This exhibition was presented at the Denver Art Museum, but in partnership with the Clifford Still. So the agendas of both institutions had to be considered throughout this process. Dean Sobel, the guest curator, had never experienced this curator-educator collaborative model, but wanted to respect the Denver Art Museum's process. Stefania Van Dyke, our master teacher, wanted to be sensitive to the fact the dean was an outside curator, but that his museum was partnering in presenting this exhibition. As a result, everyone started the process with some hesitation in communicating their opinions, but over time developed a very respectful relationship. Jumping in with both feet, the core team began discussions about the organization of the exhibition itself and its appropriateness for Denver audiences. The Albright Knox had arranged the exhibition by groupings of Buffalo donors, which was appropriate for their audience, but the team felt it wasn't going to have residence, resonance for Denver audiences, and thus the order was reimagined as roughly chronological. In developing interpretive moments, Stefania brought to the table studies conducted at the Denver Art Museum that revealed that many visitors who felt our dominant profile, and that was over 40 years old and well-educated, had a difficult time making meaning of modern art. Four art historical terms which had originally structured the exhibition, which was fauve, surrealism, abex, and pop art, were explained by the team working together, preferring explanatory phrases such as the power of color or expressive energy and the mind's eye. Dueling quotes were used on the wall, one from critics and one from the artist explaining what he was trying to do, additional objects and then a small amount of explanatory text completed each area. The label writing process was divided as Dean proposed that he write all of the section panels and Stefania write all the extended labels. Both then reviewed and commented on each other's work. In addition, an audio tour was jointly developed between the curator and educator. Okay. The third case study is an expanded four-way collaboration between curator, master teacher, conservator, and the local art community. Development of this new textile art gallery followed our standard collaboration process between curator and master teacher when developing the storyline, object groupings, and the exhibition text. The curator and the master teacher agreed that some objects would benefit from additional interpretation provided through technology, and both worked together incorporating iPads into the exhibition and working on the content together. Directly adjacent to the main exhibition gallery was a very large space called the Threads Studio, and it was a hands-on activity area for visitors as well as for members of local textile guilds who used the space for meetings and group sewing, knitting, and lace making, for instance. While this area was largely implemented by the education department, the curator was heavily involved in the conceptual stage. Because there was only one contemporary quilt in the exhibition, the curator and master teacher agreed that it was important to engage contemporary art quilt makers. Together they developed a complementary exhibition of 10 small quilts that were made specifically in response to pieces on view in the main gallery. Uh, in addition, openable drawers and cabinets facilitated the very successful visitor experience. Additionally, the curator and master teacher together developed complementary hands-on activities in this area for the Thread Studio. On the same floor, but directly adjacent to the textile art gallery, is a space called the Preview Space. And this is a shared staging area between curatorial, education, and conservation. All three parties collaborated on the interpretive content on the entrance to the space, and you can see this right here, um, so as to fully represent everyone's activities in this area. Every Thursday, there's an open window when visitors can watch conservators at work, and these are two conservators repairing a French tapestry. 
Other times, visitors are allowed closer observation of conservation activity and the opportunity to ask questions by actually entering the space. And on a regular schedule, there are formal presentations by the conservators about their ongoing projects or by the curator or a fiber artist in the space. This entire floor is extremely popular with museum visitors because of the layered display and interpretation developed by curators, educators, conservators, and the art community together. Okay. And the last case study I would quickly like to take us back to the Native Arts Department to a temporary exhibition of Navajo blankets called Red, White, and Bold, Masterworks of Navajo Design, 1840 to 1870. Here the curator proposed the concept of concentrating on one art form over a very short period of time, 30 years, focusing on what artists did with color and design to break down the prevalent stereotype of old Indian rugs as utilitarian craft items and not artworks. The curator and master teacher together decided on minimal labeling and other interpretive didactics and to instead create a compelling gallery experience that would carry the weight of what we would normally do with labels. We wanted these visitors to see the textiles in a new way as beautifully designed and woven artworks and to feel themselves wrapped in that beauty. We had the perfect opportunity to present this exhibition in a stunning architectural space with a very high ceiling. And we worked very closely with a brilliant exhibition designer as part of the team to achieve that feeling of being wrapped in bold colors and patterning created by master Navajo artists. Two visitor comments typify the overwhelmingly positive response to this presentation. Quote, it's interesting to see that we're all the same. We're all creative. We all use color. We're really not that different. We just use and see things differently. And a second quote, it gives you a new perspective at looking at Navajo rugs. I saw it as, oh my gosh, these people are wearing their art, unquote. So in summary, and speaking on behalf of Heather, we work so closely from conception to completion that it's sometimes difficult to separate our specific roles. It is, however, clear from our visitor studies that their museum experience is significantly enhanced by all of the multiple collaborations within the museum. Thank you. I am Allison Agston, curator of public engagement at the Hammer Museum. And I can assure you that when I started my job at the Hammer more than five years ago, everybody wanted to know why. And I bet people still do, otherwise we wouldn't be sitting here talking about it. At the time, it was a really novel idea. And um, some people raised their eyebrows about it, and maybe some people still do, but I think less than they used to. Even just hearing Nancy talk about the change in name of the education department at her museum, which is something that I've certainly observed myself throughout the country. There are now many other people that have titles similar to mine. I'm not alone. Anyway, why did the museum embark upon this? Um, we love this, but that's not really why we weren't looking to do more educationally. We really had to actually fix this. This is a grainy picture from my old-fashioned iPhone about five years ago. We had to really address the visitor experience situation at the Hammer. If you can believe it, you used to get your tickets at our third floor bookstore. So you'd kind of cycle up to the top, you didn't know where you were, you'd go into the bookstore, you'd buy a ticket, they'd get out a pencil and they'd make a little hash mark saying that you came. And that didn't seem like maybe the best way. It was counterintuitive. And I think the hammer, known for being a cutting edge progressive institution, it wasn't really aligned with that. Somebody's raising their hand back there. Yeah. 
Thank you. Is that any better? Okay, good. So there were two things we were thinking about. Uh, visitor services on the most basic, very, very basic level. Having a front desk, like you see here, this is the mock-up for it. Having a front desk in our lobby with people sitting there that could give you tickets and answer your questions. And then simultaneously, the museum and its artist council, which is kind of what it sounds like, an artist board, were thinking more and more about um, social practice, socially engaged art. And we wondered if there wasn't some way to somehow bring the two together. So in 2009, the museum received a very substantial grant from the James Irvine Foundation to begin thinking about this. And in fact, when I started, I was curator of public engagement and director of visitor services. Eventually, those two things separated. And after a couple of years, visitor services went on to the development department where it's really thriving. I think, though, conceptually, those things are really aligned, working with artists to make art projects that connect with the public and basic visitor services. They actually require two totally different things. On one hand, I'm you know, coordinating how to make a nudist day at the museum, which we didn't do. And on the other hand, I'm trying to find the right devices that sync with our bank when we take credit cards, and it just didn't work out. People ask me a lot about the hybridity of that position, and I think if your institution is interested in that, my recommendation is always that you provide an equal amount of support staff as if there were actually two people doing those jobs. And I find that visitor services is um, much better staffed in development than it was under my little nascent department. So our very first artist in residence who we worked with for a year is the LA-based art collective machine project. And in that first year, they had a very specific directive to help us solve some of the problems of the museum. And this is an example of that, that this piece is called the giant hand. I bet you can see why. It is a highly stylized Victorian hand on top of a tower, which is, represents the building that our offices are in. And then below that is the actual museum. And this piece was meant to address our ongoing and major wayfinding issues. So you would walk up to the giant hand and kind of like at an area where this podium is, you'd press a button that would either say bathroom or galleries or theater and you'd press the button and then that hand would just start twirling around wildly and eventually it would stop at the bathrooms or the theater. And if you can believe it, I think this one actually caused me more trouble than that nudist night that I was never even able to pull off because of somebody's maternity leave issues. It's another story. Uh, because what we found out is that the museum actually totally has an entrenched opinion about marketing and about wayfinding. So let's say some high-ranking people at the museum said, well, we think you should be pointing to a different bathroom. And the artist would say, well, you wouldn't, you know, if this was a painting, you wouldn't tell me to choose red instead of blue. It was really, really tense. And at the end of this year, we realized that a core part of the problem is that we were, we were instrumentalizing the artists. And they didn't like that. And perhaps they weren't even able to do their best work because of this arrangement. So we shifted gears. We asked artists to continue to consider the visitor experience in their projects. And we have kind of run off of that model in the last four years since then. So I'll give you a couple examples of what we've done, and then I'll talk to you a little bit about how we actually pull it off at the hammer. This is a project by Lisa Ann Auerbach, also based in LA. And I should actually stop and say something about working with LA artists. I do this primarily for two reasons. Very small budget. And also, I think when you're working with socially engaged artists, there's something about working with artists that are already embedded in your community. Um, there's this parachuting effect that doesn't always work when you bring somebody in for a short term to work with, with the community and then when they're done, they leave. So I think it also benefits the work and our audience when we're working with local artists. And fortunately, being in LA, our local artists are truly exceptional. So Lisa noticed that there was a kind of heavy guard presence in our galleries. And she began to investigate. This project took us a really long time to make because there are many sensitivities involved. Um, I think how we worked with the guards in the beginning wasn't super. Uh, we thought, well, the guards would love it 
if Lisa came in and maybe re-envisioned their uniform so it doesn't, you know, doesn't look so stiff. And they actually um, felt a little bit defensive about that. They felt like their uniforms gave them some sense of authority. They felt comfortable in their uniforms. And more importantly, they didn't feel like they were really being asked what we thought they might want to do. It wasn't the same thing as what they would have wanted to do. So instead of totally scrapping the project, we just decided to give it time and see where it would go. There was many other projects going on simultaneously. It was a luxury to be able to do that, but we did. So anyway, Lisa trains to be a guard, and she actually works in the galleries for a week or so. And she noticed something that's, I'm, act, I'm act a little bit embarrassed to talk about this, but it's true. She noticed that when she was dressed as a guard, that the staff that she knows really well would walk in and out, and they wouldn't even, they didn't know it was her. And I, I mean, it's not like she's wearing a clown costume. It's not impossible to tell who that is. It's just there's a sort of invisibility that the guards sometimes have in the galleries. And she also noticed that she was more physically exhausted than she could have ever imagined, that the standing is really taxing. So we resumed the conversations with the guards, and they, they became a little bit more open, I think, since Lisa literally stood in their shoes. She had a little bit more street cred with them. So she proposed a project called United We Stand. We bought a couple of sets of blazers, and each of the guards wrote a phrase about standing on the back of their blazer. You can see. We had them sequined, and then they wore them in the galleries for a couple of weeks. And it was really interesting because um, I did interviews with the guards afterwards, and they all reported that they had never interacted with visitors more. People wanted to talk to them. They asked them great questions. They felt part of the dialogue. But maybe the best part of this project is that, as a result, we bought stools for every single guard post in the museum. And if you're a curator, and you are making a show at the museum, and you do not want to have a stool at one of those posts, you got to get approval from our director. Really positive outcome. This is a project we did in our lobby gallery a couple of years ago called Dream Home Resource Center. On the walls, it tells kind of an alternative history of housing in Los Angeles, which is complicated, probably as it is in your cities as well. And then the centerpiece that sold sort of like golden amalgam with a blue chair um, it's, it's a sculpture, all by Olga Komanduros, and every day for two months we had different housing experts come in and give free advice. So we had um, an attorney who specialized in housing, we had squatting rights activists, we had tenants' rights activists, we had all of these people, but also speaking Spanish. And um, we made some forms that people kind of, like some waivers people had to fill out. And they also recorded the process a bit. And we were able to get a sense of how much help people actually received with this project. This is a, those are my dance moves on the left. Uh, this is a long, felt really long, three-month residency that we did with a collective called Kechung Radio. They're often referred to as a pirate radio station. They're not really a pirate radio station. They're just kind of wild like pirates. And they make dozens and dozens of programs every week from a little low frequency radio station in Chinatown. And the people that make the programs are largely artists and other really interesting thinkers. So we invited them to the museum to think about what a little radio station could be at a museum. And they did a variety of programs from whisper reports where they would roll that cart into our galleries and then they'd whisper into the mic at the station what was going on like that lady has really squeaky shoes or stuff like this and people laughed hysterically they also did a radio mystery play at the museum that was set off by little transponders so if you had your you had your little recorder and you're walking around it would set off different clues um, and we've done a couple of residencies like this with large groups where we say, give us some general ideas, and then they end up making a few dozen things over the course of a couple of months. It was really hard when we did it that first time with Machine Project, and it's still challenging, but we've kind of developed, developed a bit of a muscle for this now, and I have a better sense of the institution's capacity, and I always try to program to that, which is really important if you're gonna get this stuff done with your colleagues, and if you wanna remain friends with your colleagues. So one more thing I wanted to touch about before we kind of get to the how it's done that I don't think is often discussed in these conversations about engage, 
engagement at museums, when we talk about education or at the curatorial, which is the rise of social media, which I think nobody I've really talked to about this really agrees with me, so I should, I don't know, maybe I should stop talking about it, but clearly I'm not going to do that today. I'm going to talk to, talk to you about it. I think that there is a connection between the way that we have begun to talk to visitors and the tenor of programming at many museums now. We have, for many years, created this kind of warm conversational tone online, and then on site, it doesn't always match up. I personally think that's problematic. And um, I just, as I was making this presentation, pulled something off of LACMA's Twitter, just because I thought it had a certain kind of tone. It's the, um, the quote thanking people for being a part of LACMA, and even the sort of abbreviation that's acquired, that's required with Twitter to meet that character count, I think it, it changes things. I think there's something there. Anyway, at about this time in the conversation, everybody just really wants to know how we do this sort of thing, and it really boils down to this question here. Tell me about your org chart. So um, I consider myself to be amongst a group that we casually refer to as the programmers. That's myself, the woman who runs academic programs, which is kind of like our version of education, and also the woman who runs public programs, which are a really dynamic series in our theater and much of what I think the Hammer is known for, actually. So we are often in conversation about, oh, I'm doing a really big, high-impact event the first weekend of May, so I just wanted to let you guys know so we can all work around that. So we did that kind of like logistical coordinating with one another, and we're trying to do a better job of syncing our program up, although our programs up, although I think that's one area that we really have to improve. Um, so those are more casual conversations, but my more formal conversations about my work are within the curatorial department, because I know these curator of education and public engagement or whatever can mean different things at different places, and they could be situated differently. But for me, it means I'm in the curatorial department, and I go to the curatorial meetings, and I make my proposals probably the same way everybody else does, except I think I get asked probably about 200% more questions. And they usually start with, so how's this going to work? And that's the thing when you do this kind of job. Like, if you guys are proposing a painting show, nobody's going to ask you how that's going to work. But people ask me how it's going to work. We're going to build this little cart, and we're going to set up an audio system, and then we're going to roll it around, and we're going to take it here, and we're going to take it there. There's always that question of, how does it work? Finally, I wanted to just share my um, contact information with you. Hopefully, we can stay in touch. I have a feeling that the email address that you have for me is my Hammer email address, but I'm actually uh, leaving the Hammer next year after, or next month, rather, after more than five great years. I am going to be the director of a new museum that's being developed in downtown LA that will open in the next few years or thereabouts. Thank you. Congratulations. Okay, can everyone hear me? Can you hear me at the back? Okay, so I have a habit of moving around a lot, so I'll try and stay still, but if I happen to... <laughs> then please shout, yep. Okay, so... Let's, let's just... Do I need to move forward? Okay, and then again? One more time. Okay, there we go. So... What I'm going to be doing today is talking to you about an experiment that we're about halfway through at the ROM, which is the idea of introducing something called centers of discovery. And this is actually a really, really interesting experiment. I've never heard of another museum in the world that's doing this. And part of why I came, why I left the UK to come to Canada or to go to Canada um, in order to take up the role I've currently got is because I wanted to help shape this. We're about halfway through, so what I'll be giving you is a, a halfway through status report. 
But before I do that, I'll just give you a very brief background to the ROM, because it is important in terms of understanding why we ended up with this way forward. So the Royal Ontario Museum, or the ROM as we call it in Toronto, um, is the largest museum in Canada for the US. It's probably a medium-sized museum. Um, and just to give you an idea, it's got about 30,000 objects on display I'm going to give you lots of numbers now just to give you a feel for the size. 300 staff gets about a million visitors a year. Um, its collection is both very deep and very broad. Um, they, it's got about 6 million objects. The advantage of having lots of natural history objects is that um, the numbers shoot up very quickly. Um, so... Uh, so don't panic when you hear 6 million. Um, I've also heard people say it's got 12 million. I suspect it depends on how many, whether you count every individual insect. Um, it's um, got an international focus in terms of its collections. Um, and it's got about 200,000 200, square feet of exhibitions, of permanent exhibition space. Um, so, and the collection ranges all the way from world cultures to natural history. And I'm just going to show you three images of the, some of the galleries so you get an idea. Um, so we've got a very, very strong uh, minerals collection, including um, an extraordinary collection of meteorites. Um, and this is the, the gallery of that. Um, we've got a very strong um, uh, fossils collection and dinosaur collection so we cover natural history as well as co um, covering what we call world cultures which includes um, and there's an image here of um, one of our China galleries we've got an extraordinary China, um, China collection as well as obviously having a very strong Canadian collection collections from across the world so and fashion and textiles and a whole range of different things so it really is an encyclopedic museum. We include, we include art, art, we include paintings as well. So it's a, it's a very, very broad collection. Um, four years ago, before I arrived, um, when our new director arrived, um, the ROM did a bit of a strategic survey. It basically said, um, put in place a new strategy, and it said what's working and what's not working. And I'll just run through that list because it'll probably sound very familiar to most of you. Um, it said the ROM could probably be a bit more public facing. It's very good at talking to itself. It's not so good at talking to its visitors. The ROM could probably a bit, be a bit better used. People tend to come back once, maybe possibly twice, but we want them to come back more often. The ROM could possibly be more relevant. The ROM should probably be a lot more joined up in term of, terms of its research. It has about 35 curators and lots, several technicians as well. So it's got a strong research team, but it struggles to pull together research as much as it really wants to do. Um, and the ROM felt that it wasn't very well joined to the many networks that existed across the city of Toronto and across Ontario and Canada. And also it felt like there were lots of competing priorities across the organization rather than a set of shared priorities. So hands up, who can recognize at least one of those within their institution? Wow, the whole of this side of the room is perfect. Well done. <laughs> so uh, as you can see, it's, it's, it was quite a common set of um, things that Ron wanted to change. It also asked visitors and said to visitors, so what... Is it that you would like to see more of? Um, and what, what is it that you find hard about the museum? And visitors said, we find it really hard to work out what's inside the museum. So we know the museum for dinosaurs or mummies, but what about everything else? They also said, oh, you do research? In what sense do you do research? So even though we were investing a huge amount, we have a large number of scientists who go off into the field every year, we have a large amount of anthropologists, again, who go off into the field, even though we were doing this, the research wasn't visible to, to visitors. And groups were saying to us, we don't really know, special interest groups, how to connect with you. And so... After a lot of debate and discussion within the museum, sitting down, the um, 
uh, the museum set up several working parties, they came up with the idea of centers of discovery. And I'm now going to describe what the centers of discovery are. If we just pass, oh, that's an image of um, what, another one of our galleries, a gallery looking at biodiversity. So we basically ended up with eight centers of discovery. And the, the name can be a bit misleading. Um, the center of discovery is not a place that you go to, even though it might sound like it. It's a virtual center. It's more like a center of excellence. So what a center of discovery is, is it's, is it's a grouping of curators. And a curator can belong to more than one center, if they, if they so wish, and if, if, their, if their research interests and their collection bridge more than one center. Um, and it's a way for visitors so it basically is designed to solve all of the problems I've mentioned. So what the center is, 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 is it has someone in charge of it called a managing director who doesn't actually manage the curators, they manage the ideas and they manage the strategy. So what they do, the managing director of say, let's take Canada as an example. So the, the ROM has a couple of curators uh, Canadian curators who look after Canada. It has two Canadian galleries. 60% of its collections roughly relate to Canada and many of the curators within the ROM actually work on aspects of Canada. So a lot of those are natural history curators who will be studying Canadian geology or Canadian fossils or the, the history of life in Canada. What the managing director for Canada will do, as we say in the job description, is they will pull together all of the curators. They will work, sit down with the curators. They will understand the various aspects of Canadian research that's happening across the ROM. They will work with the curators so they understand the scope of the Canadian collection. It's about 60% of them. They will work with the curators and they will work with the programs team and the exhibition team and the web team and the social media team, and the marketing team, and pull together a strategy for how Canada will be represented in the ROM. They will then, for individual programs, they will act as the liaison between the curatorial teams and the programming, exhibitions, permanent gallery teams, et cetera, et cetera. So they will attend a lot of the meetings. They will, so not every single curator has to attend the meetings. They will, um, they will work on a lot of the detail of that. And they would also have their own projects where those fit within the strategy for that center. So does that give you an idea? I'm sure you'll have lots of questions of how we envisage the centers. And on paper, that makes perfect, perfect sense. Yeah? It's a new system. And so whenever you translate, as a manager, I can say this, whenever you translate something that's on paper into something in reality, things don't quite go as you imagine. You have to put quite a lot of work in. So... What we did, I'll just, mention, I'll just talk about the eight centers and how we got to these. Canada cuts right across all of the different collections, as actually does contemporary culture. We don't have a special contemporary culture curator or a special contemporary culture um, collection, but each individual curator will be collecting. So the African curator will be looking at Af contemporary African art or looking at contemporary African culture, etc., etc. You can look across all the collections. Those two cover all the collections. The others are very specific to specific curators. And I don't need to go through the details, but you can imagine which type of curator is in each of those, in e each of those centers. And as I say, some curators can work on several. So we've so far appointed three of the managing directors within this. And what I want to do now is show you very briefly, run through a PowerPoint presentation that was put together by our managing director of 
biodiversity, to talk about what it is, his name is Dave Ireland, to talk about what it is he does. Because in that great way, there's a slight disjunction between what we said on paper managing directors should do and what in their own words they actually do. And I think that's quite instructive at this midpoint in us trying to put in place the whole system. So, what Dave does, um, he is responsible for the, remember that biodiversity gallery I showed you? It has um, several people, um, uh, volunteers and staff in it, who animate it, who talk to people, have uh, handling um, and do various things. And he's responsible for the strategy and the way forward for that. Um, he does uh, things like on the right hand side, we, we, we rescued, well, rescued, we rescued the skeleton of a blue whale um, that was stranded in Canada. Um, and we, and it, it caught a lot of press. And we've had a lot of activations around the blue whale. We didn't have any capacity within the programming staff or the curatorial staff to talk about it. So Dave took responsibility for working with the curators, working with the programmers to make sure it was tweeted a lot, to make sure that um, we put a big, this, this big um, decal on the floor off a blue whale. And we had lots of activations during our different holidays to talk about blue whales and what we did. So he was there to pick this up um, at a time when other people were very busy. Um, uh, he supports the research and collections. So the curators do research, the managing directors do not do research, but what they do is they make sure that that research is visible front of house. Remember visitors said they didn't know we did research? The managing director is responsible for making that research visible front of house. So he'll organize for curators to stand in the galleries at busy times and talk to visitors um, about different things and facilitate those. Um, this is Dave's explanation of um, the things that happen back of house, the kind of research that happens, taxonomy, systematics, evolutionary biology. And then towards the bottom are the areas that he tends to get much more involved in. Things like, right at the bottom, citizen science, um, restoration ecology. So the managing director tends to take forward the more public-facing sides if you had to draw a continuum of um, deep scientific work through to public engagement, he tends to take, the, or the managing directors tend to take the more public engagement side. Um, he organizes small touring exhibitions which talk about issues that we are really concerned about. He um, organizes things like um, Friday Night Live is our big when we're open on every uh, Friday evening. We get about 3,500 people through. He organized um, a, a, a live link-up with curators in the field, in this case in Borneo. And as you can see, people came and listened to curators talking. Um, he t he's responsible for our game jam when we bring in um, many uh, programmers to listen to curators and then convert that into computer games. It's kind of a, over, a, over a weekend, they basically work solidly in the museum, fed by lots of pizza um, to act to, and Coke to, to, to deliver this. Um, and then he attends a lot of meetings on behalf of the curators. Uh, and he proposes exhibitions, uh, 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 not exhibitions, programs. So this is a talk coming up. Um, and he'll work with, our, with the curators to make sure it work, it's going to work, and with the programming team. Um, and then he is also responsible. He came up with the idea of linking with a university to do the environmental visual communication course, which is where students learn about how to communicate about the environment to the public, whether that's through photography, through blogging, etc. And as part of that, they spend a period of time in the museum helping out curators and the programming team. So 
he really does bridge between the two sides, if you like, of the museum. So if I had to summarize halfway through what's working and what we need to, we need to work on, I would, say, I would say this. I would say what's working, having the centers of discovery really helps us raise money in a way that we couldn't before, we can actually go and talk to potential donors and talk to them about a center that interests them and get them excited. Um, through bringing in managing directors, we really are bringing in skills that in a traditional museum structure, we wouldn't necessarily, there wouldn't be an obvious place for them. Each of the managing directors has a different set of skills that we don't currently have in, in the museum. We are saving curatorial time because a lot of the attending meetings, et cetera, et cetera, can get carried over by the managing director. Um, and we are, oops, and, uh, oh, the battery's run down. Battery's run down? My limited technical knowledge. Oh, no, battery hasn't run down. Thank you, thank you. And, and we are decreasing silos across the institution in a way that we said we would, because actually the managing directors, although they work to me, I only ever meet them with my equivalent in collections, so deputy director collections and research. We sit down with them together, and together we work together on what needs to be done um, in any particular area. What isn't working yet, and we have to work on, is we still have to do more work on defining people's roles. Because as you can imagine, we brought in a whole additional group of people, and so everyone's still going, I used to do that. Is that person doing it now? What that's also meant is that within the curatorial teams, they are trying to be far more explicit about what their role is. And that is both good and bad. I'd say it's good because it's, because it's always useful to think about your role, but it's bad because actually I'd say when you, the minute you start to say, my role stops here, your role starts here, you st your job becomes less interesting. Everyone's job becomes less interesting. And actually, the flexibility and nimbleness of the organization decreases. So I think there's a bit of work we need to do around that whole role definition. And what we're doing is every time we hit something like that, we're sitting down again and working through it. Um, and I also think we need to do a bit more work on explaining what the centers of discovery are. I spent quite a while trying to explain it. Um, and I think that will happen when all of the managing directors are in place and we've been running it a while, we will get much better at explaining it. So I'm going to stop there. That's, so that's where we've got to with the centers of discovery. I'm sure there'll be lots of questions in the conversation that follows. Thank you. Oh, there, it's on. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. It was a really interesting, uh, informative panel. I really appreciate the different perspectives. Um, I, wish, I wish I had a uh, succinctly formed question. I have a kind of messy, I don't even know if it's a question. I don't even know if it's just for you or if it's for us as a group. But um, Xerxes, you, you kind of ended with defining roles and the question I was thinking about throughout the entire panel. Um, we had had previous conversations when we were talking about what this panel would be about and one of the things that you had raised was um, who is an expert and what does expertise mean? And I'm thinking about that in, relationship to, in relation to the curatorial profession. Um, 
just some observations. You know, we, you know, we hear that this shift from object-based focus is often seen as the educational turn, but I think we also see in our PhD programs a similar shift from object-based research, and we have uh, PhDs in art history who are coming into curatorial positions who don't have object-based training. Are they more qualified to be a curator? Is that, are, are they the experts more so than, for instance, uh, a master teacher at the Denver Art Museum who has a background in education and, and a master's and has been working with collections. Um, you have, uh, we talk about, you know, museums and curatorial profession also, you know, just as being object-based and a distinct feature of some of these projects, I'm thinking about what Allison does as being about uh, process or, or performance or, um, you know, engagement, whatever you want to call it. Um, is what Allison does as curator of public engagement much different from what a curator of contemporary art who works with performance art, ephemeral art um, does? I'm thinking, you know, some of your projects really resonate. There was a recent exhibition at Al Jaira Contemporary Art Center in Newark of Derek Adams' project, The Holdout, and very similar kind of project and, you know, curated by somebody who has a title of curator. Um, we have, uh, you know, is this really reflect the hybridity of our time, the move to interdisciplinarity and hum humanities in general? Um, so I guess what I'm saying is, in response to this, and this kind of speaks to how you ended, do we sharpen or refine the definition of the curator? Do we define our roles? Do I dig our heels and do we say that as a profession, this is what we do? Or do we maintain a flexibility? Um, and I don't know. That's a question for you guys if you want to speak to that. And then I, that's going to be my only question because I know everybody has uh, questions to ask from the panelists. I think we only have about 15 minutes. So if you want to speak. I think we're all on to that. OK. It's not on. OK, there we go. Um, well, my institution was certainly flexible. They spent eight or nine months looking for a curator with a traditional more traditional background, I should say, somebody with more experience in performance, and they ended up hiring me. I have a BA in English. I um, was a producer at CNN. I covered the arts. I worked at LACMA, where I developed the social media presence there and worked on lots of other interesting digital projects. And I think, ultimately, I was hired on a sensibility, certainly not a PhD or relevant curatorial experience, although I'll say that even in the five years that I've had this job, and in fact when I have gone to hire a couple of different curatorial assistants now, the number of PhDs that I've interviewed that have totally relevant experience is just like gone like this. I think the other thing about these programs that we're talking about that train curators, we kind of also have to think about the MFA programs. Now there's a number of really serious MFA programs for social practice. So in addition to a certain kind of professionalization in this field, artists are also being trained a bit differently. I guess I just, mine's not, on, there it is, okay. Um, I would say it depends on the institution. Um, and certainly over my career, I have learned to become much more flexible rather than more specialized in my area. It is an institutional mandate, of course, that we all collaborate, but it's somewhat individual by the master teacher or the, uh, the curator. But I find myself much more engaged broadly in so many different ways and being flexible, which to me is much more interesting than just specialized in one area. And, and again, visitor studies tell us that that variety is something that they appreciate as well. Okay, so I would tackle that question a different way. Okay. So I would say, so, and, and I would answer it by saying, I kind of don't care what anyone's called, but I want to, so I don't, I don't really mind if someone's called a curator or interpretation or programs or teacher, um, but every institution needs to work out what are the skills it absolutely needs and needs to make sure those are held somewhere. So in all the institutions I've worked in, um, and I'm lucky I've always worked in, a re in research institutions, um, we've always needed 
people who understand what research is, how to do it, how to distinguish good research, how to use it and turn it into the public in, into public in some way. And in all of those institutions, that skill has been held within the curatorial team. So I don't mind, yeah, it's great to have flexible people. Obviously, the more flexible the people you have, the better. But in all of this, we mustn't lose sight. We mustn't wake up one day and go, oh, there's no one in the institution who understands research because we've just been employing people who are great at communicating with the public, but not good researchers. Or um, the same for people who understand objects and understand the power of objects and the power of art. I don't mind where that knowledge and that those skills exist, but I think we need to keep an eye on those things. So almost, I would say, we need to define in a very loose way, what are the absolute, are there any absolute essentials for a curator? And then what are all the really nice to have? And wouldn't it be great if as well as being a good researcher, you, you can tweet and you can talk to the public and you can do all these other things. And it will depend on the institution and how large you are and a whole range of other things. Yeah, I think uh, that's, uh, I don't know if this is it's working now. Um, I think that that's an interesting way to think about it, and maybe I think that sometimes we do talk more about naming and classification of who we are more so than about what inherently is it about what we do um, in terms of research and, and working with objects or, or working with art making practices. Um, and Allison, I think your point also about the different training programs, I mean, a point I wanted to add was just, you know, the, these curatorial training programs are also very different. I mean, you have the kind of classic PhDs in art history, which may or may not train you know, you as to be a curator, and then you have the curatorial training programs, which some of which are object-based, and some are you know about critical practice and curation. Um, there's a program in South Africa that's entirely about the archive. So many different ways of thinking about what it is to be a curator. Um, but I'm going to open it up to the floor because I think that this is about audience engagement and um, engaging my peers here and asking questions. So I don't know if anybody wants to respond to what the first question what we're talking about or if they have other questions for our panelists. Let's a question back there. And this is really, this is working. Helen. This is for Xerxes. What does a manager, managing director's skill set have to be that's outside of what is already in a museum? You mentioned that two or three times. Yeah. So, so what's interesting about managing the managing directors we've appointed so far and the ones we've gone on to appoint is that each one of them has got something very different. Um, and we are not, we don't, we don't go out there and we're not specific about what that needs to be. Um, and they've come from different backgrounds. So um, uh, Dave Ireland has to be one of the best um, public engagement with science and um, people that, uh, that I know, actually. Um, and that's his skill set that wasn't one that we had within the museum. And that's the thing that he as an individual brings. Um, the, um, the managing director that we've appointed for, actually for three of the centers combined, because we're trying to launch all at the same time, um, ancient cultures, world cultures, textiles, fashion, his skill set is well he came he was a curator um, but his skill set is very much he he really really can make can do really impressive public programming and and is very good at getting money for that alongside being a curator so he's he's brought another mix we're about to appoint someone who's got who is probably one of the best storytellers i've ever come across who can just mesmerize people by sitting down we're about to appoint someone who has a remarkable connection with um with uh places like nasa and really understands how children work with um with new technologies, which again is not a skill set we have in the museum, but is something they can bring in addition to their managing directorship. So we're being very, very flexible about this, but we're making sure that every person we appoint brings something additional and extra to the museum. It's a great chance, because it, they're not pigeonholed, it's a great chance to get these skills into the museum. Does that answer the question? 
Okay. Other questions? Swim back there. How many curators are there at the ROM? I, I know there are quite a lot. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so there are, there are 30, 35, 36 curators? 35. So there needed to be something to bring them into some kind of dialogue. And did you say within each center they meet regularly within each center to exchange ideas? And then the manager takes away the ideas and then takes them directly to the implementation stage? So or does the manager take them back to the curators and re-engage them? What's happening there? Yeah. So, so, so those, are great. those are great questions. Um, each managing director does it in a different way. Um, and that's one of the things we need to look at again. Um, so, uh, so some of the managing directors meet the curators individually um, and then meet them as a group. Um, some of them just meet them as a group. Um, some of them work with the curators to propose ideas and they'll propose them jointly. Others basically say well, look, to the curators, well, why don't you propose that idea and I can then work on the detail with the programming team and we'll come back to you. So every, we're still at the stage where this is very flexible and what, what I'm not sure of is whether we should keep it flexible uh, because it's all to do, ultimately, everything in a museum is to do with personalities and people's preferred way of working. And so I'm one of those people who doesn't want to impose too much of a structure unless we need to. What about getting all the managers and all the curators into one room together? So, so we do do that as well. Um, so we do, we do meet with the, um, for a lot of different things, we meet with we, we're divided into two curatorial teams, and we'll meet with the two, cur two curatorial teams and with the programming team and the, um, and the uh, exhibitions team, etc. cetera, um, every six months um, is, the, is the process that we're setting up. So we're still in the process of setting up processes to make this work. Hey, you can tell I'm a manager, can't you? <laughs> Hi, I'm Amy Powell at Kernard Art Museum at the University of Illinois. And I had a question for Allison. Um, I wonder if you could um, talk a little bit about uh, best practices, maybe, or successful strategies, methods for managing relationships, both with artists and with your colleagues. Um, I, I might be looking for some war stories and what you've learned. Well, you've come to the right person. I have a lot of war stories, and I like to think that I'm an open book so we can always connect afterwards because I'll tell you the good, the bad, and the ugly. Um, my first year at the Hammer was a real shock to the system for myself and for the museum because before I got there, they said, we're going to bring in Machine Project. On Machine Project, we give you carte blanche, except once Machine Project was there and they wanted to do tons and tons of programs and some of them were um, problematic in some ways for some people at the museum. Um, there was, a, I think, a desire to draw the line. And that was hard for the artists, and that was hard for me. And from my perspective, I figured, well, you guys hired me, so you must want me here. But um, it didn't always feel like I was wanted there. And one of the biggest problems that I have eventually overcome is the relationship the relationships with the other programmers, as I call them, public programs and academic affairs. We, we have um, created some boundaries between us that we all clearly understand, and maybe the public doesn't understand them, and maybe even the rest of the museum doesn't, but I work with artists to make socially engaged art projects. Claudia makes public programs usually in the theater or another space called the Annex. Teresa does interpretive programs, so we all kind of stay in our lane. And that, that might sound restrictive, but it actually makes it so that we can work well with one another. 
And we also do a pretty good job of saying, hey, I'm interested in doing this screening series, and I think that this is why it works within my area, and I just wanted to sit down and talk with you about it. In fact, this happened a few months ago with um, Claudia, who runs public programs, who's become a good friend of mine, and she said, I gotta tell you, like, film screenings are kind of my thing, and this thing that sounds really interesting to you, since it's kind of my specialty, I can tell you, it's been done before, and I think it's more my territory, and I backed off. So that's kind of how I deal with that. Um, with artists, I'm pretty good about laying out our parameters early on so that we come up against less of the issues that we had in the beginning. Uh, for example, we are a tenant in the building of Occidental Petroleum. Armin Hammer ran Occidental Petroleum and founded the Hammer. And I'm just gonna say this, it's not always an easy relationship with our landlord. So I kind of lay out some of those restrictions early on. I try to be as candid as I can, and I'm also much, much, much better at managing the proposal process and getting an idea from an artist that will allow them to have some flexibility, but that will also lay out for me any of the problematics so that we can kind of sort through that in the beginning and nobody finds themselves really disappointed in the end. But I'm so happy to talk more about this later if you'd like. A flight, which is why she's, she's left us, but we have a time for, we have a couple minutes left, maybe for uh, one or two more questions. Mark. <laughs> uh, writing a job description for the, uh, the managing director, you, writing, writing a job description for the managing director, you, you said you'd prize certain attributes that may be that may be something that you couldn't really quantify in a, in a position description because a lot of them depend on who you've hired before and, and how you balance that with somebody else who comes in. I mean, how do you approach this? Okay, so... So the, so the job descriptions... I've got, in fact, with me a job description for, man, for the Canada Managing Director. We, 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 we basically ask for a whole range of attributes in the in the job description, um, and we don't talk about, and you have to have something else that nobody else has, because, <laughs> because you just can't put that, you just can't say that. Um, not for any sort of legal reasons, but, you, but you know, actually what I'm, what I'm saying is that um, the managing director role has to have all the attributes we need, and then what's great about this, this role is that it attracts people from all kinds of sectors. I've, done, I've been recruiting for like 25 years and I've not, I've never seen the range that we're getting for this, for this role because, it's, because you're asking for someone that uh, covers across so many different areas. So we'll get people from the media, we'll get people from, cur from curatorial, we'll get people from, um, from various um, universities, we'll, we'll get people from, um, from museums, we'll get from a whole range of different, a whole, such a broad range of different fields applying that actually, um, in terms of changing a museum, it's just absolutely, it's, it's, it's quite a remarkable way of bringing in things that you just, You'd never even thought of that you needed within a museum. And it's a lovely, lovely experiment. And it's a lovely freedom to have, actually. But, to your point, within the job description, you have to focus on absolutely the list of things that the managing director, that you actually, you, you really want them to do. Does that clarify the difference between those two things? Yeah. Hi, so Young Lee from the Met. Um, the idea of Centers for Discovery was very in, is, is intriguing, and I appreciate the internal struggles and politics, I'm sure, involved in creating these new um, arenas and peoples, and also with Allison, with a new position when you came in, all of the things that you have, you've had to work, work out in terms of politics. But given the panel, I'm interested, could you say a little bit more about the public engagement or the concrete kind of results that you're hoping for with these centers of discoveries, specifically with audiences? Um, and also, Alison, when you came, what did you hope to achieve with the audiences and what do you feel are some of the successes in that arena? 
unique about the hammer and one way in which I'm extraordinarily fortunate is that we're not a super numbers driven institution. So I was given an incredible kind of flexibility and I still am to try new things without the benefit of having to draw in X number of people. I, I think that bringing in people is of course important, but I often feel like I'm going to veer toward the quality versus the quantity. Because my program was grant funded, measurement has been just a huge part of what I do. I can't ignore measurement. And in fact, I just received um, a very big grant about a year ago to run an offsite partnership with Mark Bradford and a couple of partners that he's working with where we make exhibitions and public programs off-site. And with this grant, I really learned from the first one, I actually built money into the proposal to hire legit evaluators. Because I think probably many of us doing this kind of work are doing our own ad hoc evaluation. And sometimes that works and sometimes it doesn't. I've actually done plenty of surveying that's made a huge impact in the way that I run um, programs along the way. Um, one of the programs that we did with Machine Project early on um, that came, was generated by an artist, of course, was needlepoint therapy. And a um, small group of people, eight people, met for a couple of weeks in our green room where they needlepointed images from our permanent collection while doing group therapy with a real therapist. So I wasn't privy to anything that happened in this activity since it was real therapy. I never saw the people come and go, and so I had to have some way to gauge whether or not this was working. So I made some simple surveys, and probably seven out of those eight people said they had a fundamental life-changing experience. They will never think of the hammer the way they think of any place else, they, in a way that almost like anthropomorphized the museum so deeply connected and so embedded in their life in a unique way and just the kind of thing that all of us dream about hearing for our programs. So when I hear that, you know, seven people had that experience, well, I, I feel like that's success. On the other end of the spectrum, I did a, um, a big kind of maximalist performance visualization of the seminal minimalist piece by Terry Riley in C last year and it drew thousands of people and they were totally delighted and moved to the extent that with the second performance we brought a video camera in just to kind of record people's responses and they said things similar so um, I guess that's I'm, I'm hoping for emotion you know and, and oftentimes we get that. And I'll be very quick, because I know we've probably run out of time. Um, so uh, we've got five areas that we measure, um, and that's increased access to our collections and research. Remember, that's one of the things I'd said. Um, so we measure that. We measure um, increased philanthropic support, um, increased strategic partnerships, community engagement, um, and then um, increase visitor experience. And we've got several ways of measuring that as well. And if anyone's interested, I can talk to you afterwards about the detail of that. But those are the five areas that we look at. Well, I want to I thank you all for, for bearing with the heat and with, with us. I hope you enjoyed this. I think it was really, I mean, it was very enlightening for me. I have a feeling that many of you will have questions for both of these guys uh, following it. So f you know, feel free to, to be in touch. And I want to thank you both for being part of this program. And thank you all for your great questions. And I think we have next up uh, our second part, part two of our curatorial slams. So thank you. Thank you.